Let's all rise. We're going to sing He is Here this morning. standing as we are you want to do remain standing we're going to do living in Canaan now all right so I need you to put oh. your hands together all right put your hands together not anybody else's <laughs> <clears throat>
y'all be seated. I didn't really know what to expect. I wasn't sure if anybody was going to be here or not, but uh, I, I didn't know we didn't know what to do. We didn't know what to do. And uh, so we kind of went with uh, what we're doing today is having Sunday morning service. And uh, from here, uh, we plan on having no Wednesday night service. And we'll have no evening service this evening. We're going to have Sunday morning service. I'm not sure about next Sunday. As far as we know right now, we don't know. So just stay close, stay in touch. We're going to be sending out texts. We'll post it on Facebook. But uh, we just don't know what to do. We don't want to overreact, don't want to underreact. You know, so you just got to find that medium, that middle of the road somewhere and and get in it. So uh, I know it's uh, it's trying on pastors all over the, all over. I've been consulting with other guys and checking to see what other guys are doing and finding out what other churches are doing. Some's called off, and we understand that. What we'd like to do is don't shake hands. I told DJ, I said, none of that. Turn around, and shake your neighbor's hand and stuff. <laughs> see, Ed, hey, good, none tempted me this morning. He stuck his hand out. I said, I ain't shaking your hand. I ain't shaking nobody's hand. I, I didn't even hold my wife's hand this morning on the way to church. She may have it. But uh, I, think, uh, I think that uh, we can overreact in a situation like this. And, but at the same time, I don't want to be the guy who's like so bent on having church. That, you know, that, you know, I kill half the congregation or something, you know. Uh, God give us common sense. I, most of us have common sense. Not everybody has it, but most of us have common sense. And so you should use that sometimes. It, it really go a long way in getting you down the road a little further, common sense. Somebody said, I have faith in Jesus. Well, if you believe that, go down at Lindell and stand on the train track when trains come and say, I have faith in Jesus, you know, and we'll pick you up in a five-gallon bucket if there's that much left of you. Uh, faith in Jesus don't make you ignorant. And uh, so we want to be wise to this situation. I don't think it's probably as bad as it's being hyped up to be. Amen. But at the same time, do I look like a doctor? No. I don't know. So uh, we're just going to try to take it day by day and see how it goes. Um, we're going to have a deacon's meeting immediately after church, and all three of us are going to meet <laughs> over here. Are there four? Praise the Lord. We're going to meet over here and uh, talk about what? I don't know, but we're going to talk about something. Uh, we're going to, I don't know how we want to do the offering this morning, but what I want to get Alex and uh, maybe Garrett back there to do is to put up, you can give online. Me and my wife do it. Uh, we actually do it every other week. Uh, so you can give online if you want to, and they'll, they'll put up a number there where you can text a number and it'll send you a link. It's a secure link. We've had no trouble with it. Uh, you just put your account information in there. It's real simple. You do it that way, and it just comes directly into the thing. Um, I want to, I'll, I'll tell you what I would really like to do. Today, I'd really like to pray for the people that has to work around this stuff. Um, yesterday, my wife and I went into the dollar store to pick up a few things that we need. I've been trying to avoid Kmart in the grocery store, or Walmart in the grocery store. And uh, just for the simple fact, number one, everybody crazy down there. I mean, when people get hit in the head and knocked out and over toilet paper, man, there's something wrong with people. And if this thing don't do you anything but to wake you up and realize that we're living in a world, it's dog eat dog. Uh, I thought yesterday, I thought yesterday, what a great time to be a church. Well, there ain't, ain't no better time to let our light shine and to be a church and to show people the love of God, 
that Christ died for. I mean, there ain't no better time because, number one, I want to tell you something. This right here scares people. And we need a wake-up call from time to time. It's scary when you get to thinking about this and how far it could go or not go. Who, who knows? But right now when people see the mad panic and the rush. Now, listen, we've just been in this thing about a week now. What are we going to do when it rocks on for two, three, four weeks? And we're going to have to, I mean, we really are going to find people in need. And if this thing goes long, you know what's going to happen? Small business owners are going to have to close. They ain't going to be able to keep their doors open. They're going to think people's going to start uh, not being able to pay their mortgages and stuff. And then they're, they're going to be fighting over stuff down here. I mean, this thing, the further it goes, people are not getting self employed, people are not getting paid. They can't work and they can't work and it just trickles down. And I, yesterday I checked, I could have booked a ticket to Denver, Colorado to see my grandkids round trip under $100. And I'm going to tell you something, I'm thinking about going on there booking three or four of them just in case this thing lifts up anytime soon. I bank them if they don't, if they don't work out. I looked yesterday, me and I checked, I said, Les, I said, you want to go to New York? I said, we'll get us some of them respirator things and we'll just, we'll just tough it out. Uh, less than $200 round trip, man. I was tickled to death, man. I'm, I'm thinking about booking some. Uh, so if you want to fly or go somewhere, it's a great time to book some tickets, and you can always cash them in if this thing, but see if this thing falls through. Uh, but anyway, it's it's a serious time, and as I, and like I say, as, as we was in the dollar store, I, I thought the poor girl working at the cash register has been around everybody that's come through that door. Those people working there at the grocery store have encountered and having to deal with all of us or. All the people that come in there, crazy people come in there, having to deal with all that, but working around that every day. These people over here at Walmart are working around that stuff every day, and they got to go to work. And everybody comes down there, and they act crazy, and they have to deal with all that kind of stuff. And uh, the people that has to work around this, that's, that's who I, I feel sorry for, but they, you know, they got to do it. And so let's pray the Lord would help them uh, in this time. Uh, and so, I, as far as taking up an offering, I think maybe I may just let Terry or some of these guys just, uh, we don't want to pass a plate, but if you've got some, we'll just kind of come by you and take it that way, uh, if we want to do that. Uh, several things I guess we could talk about today, but we, we'll do that. We're going to sing a few more songs. Um, I've got a message I've been working on been thinking about it kind of all week and pulled it together last night. So a very unusual time. I can't, I don't know that I've experienced nothing quite like this in my lifetime. And um, I hope it goes away. You know, I hope in a couple of weeks it's kind of like Ebola or swine flu or N1F1 or whatever that thing was. H1, whatever. See, I didn't get it, so I don't remember the letters. If I'd got it, I'd remember those letters. Uh, but anyway, uh, pray for people like my daughter, uh, expecting a baby just any day now, and nobody can go to the hospital. We can't go to the hospital for that, so it's crazy. Um, and pray for us as well. We'll be traveling up to uh, Greenville, South Carolina this week, easily South Carolina, outside of Greenville, and be preaching up there this week. So pray God... We'll uh, protect us up through there and uh, pray for all those people up there. They ain't got none of that flu stuff or uh, coronavirus, coronavirus. All right. Well, well let's, let's do this. Let's stand together and pray. Let's pray for all of our church family. Let's pray that the Lord... And listen... I want to thank our BYW ladies. They, they've got a call list, and they're, and they're doing some calling. And, uh, and so thank, thank y'all for doing that. Thank y'all for doing that because um, I can't call everybody. And, and for y'all breaking down and, and getting certain people and calling and checking on people, that's a real blessing. And then if you find out there's a certain need, you can call us, and so uh, we'll help take care of that.
And so I guess today in the deacons meeting a little bit, we'll, we're going to talk about what we may have to do in the future and some things we might do. We'll, we'll discuss that a little further in a private setting. All right. Uh, Terry, you want, how you going to do this? You going to get Tony to help you? That's good. That's good. Keith's coming. Uh, we just don't want to pass the plate around if they, they'll just kind of point it at you. And if you want to give, give. If you don't. That's all right. If you want to give online, we want to appreciate all of our people watching online this morning. This is so different to me. I, I can't remember ever experiencing Sunday morning quite like this. This is so different. And I wasn't really prepared for it, just to be honest with you. All right, let's pray together and ask the Lord's blessings upon these needs. Father, yes. I don't think nobody was hurt down there. Uh, yes, and also... Um, Let's remember, um, what's Kyle? Kyle and April Abernathy. A April is the one that had to be transported, and Kyle was the, um, he's the principal down at Cave Spring. And so um, remember them in your prayers, and they contacted that coronavirus at church. So if that makes y'all feeling better, at least I know one thing, y'all pray a little harder right now, won't you? Yeah, we'll be praying. Let's pray together. Fathers, we come to you today. We want to thank you, Lord, for uh, your blessings upon us. Lord, in spite of a time like what we're experiencing right now, Lord, we know that you're our refuge, you're our strength in the time of the storm. And Lord, if it takes this to wake this world up, if it takes this to wake America up and let us realize today that, God, we need you like never before, yes. so be it, Lord. And Father, I just pray today, Lord, that you'll touch this family that's uh, suffering uh, in, in such a, uh, such a hardship from this virus. We pray for April today, Lord, that your hand will be upon her and the situation she's facing. And Lord, our church family, that you'll build a hedge of protection about them. We pray for all those people that are working in hospitals and doctor's offices and, and uh, ministering to people. And these that are they're doing public jobs to take care of the groceries and Walmart. We just pray... Lord, that you'd watch over those people and, and uh, Lord, that you'd uh, put your hand upon a, a protection upon them. And Lord, we realize today that, uh, that you're a great God and that you know all things. And Lord, we just pray that you'll, uh, you'll help us through this time and let us lean to you and lean not to our own understandings, but in all of our ways, trust you. And Lord, direct our paths, direct the path of this church. Help us to have the wisdom and knowledge we need to, to deal with such things as this. We thank you, Lord, that in spite of all this, you're still worthy of praise and you're still worthy of glory. And we want to just glorify you this morning. We pray that you'll bless this offering, bless our live feed today, bless our one that are not unable to come today. We pray that your hand will be upon them as well and, and bless them where they are. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all can take a seat, but we're going to sing You Are My All in All, so you have to sing out, all right? So y'all can, can be seated as we sing. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. precious jewel Lord to give up I'd be a fool you are my all and all Jesus Lamb of God worthy is your name Jesus Lamb of God Worthy is your name. 
taking my sin, my cross, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. I walked by the tomb of Buddha, looked inside and saw his bones, traveled on to see Muhammad still wrapped up in his grave close then I journey to a garden where old Joseph left him lay the precious lamb God's own begotten he was no longer in that grave if you knew him like i know him you would know that he's alive if you felt him like i feel him resurrection deep inside you know he's living and death has died if you're wandering in the darkness come and step into the light nail scarred hands reach out to help you to pull you safe from death to life friend I too have stood where you stand could I trust in things unseen? Oh, but just one step in His direction, then in love He ran to me. If you knew Him like I know Deep inside, you know he's living, and death has died. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my. Yeah. 
side. You know he's living and death has died. Death has died. Amen. That needs to be your signature song right there, praise God. That's good, ain't it? DJ, we want to work on this mic just a little bit. I don't know what's going on with it. Just when you get time. Um, praise the Lord. That was worth coming for right there. If you knew him like I knew him. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter uh, 17 this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 17. And uh, we're going to look at a story that all of us know. Last week we looked at uh, Samson, and uh, this week we're going to look at David. David. Now, I've been preaching, I don't know how many messages, I'm going to say somewhere close to 60 services we've spent in the Old Testament, because this is message number 42, and some of them I preach Sunday morning and Sunday night. So I know at least 42 messages that we've preached, and then some of them were four parts. So they went Sunday morning, Sunday night, we, uh, next Sunday morning, Sunday night. So we, we've been for a year. I, w I want you to understand the book, and I think that's where uh, we fall short a lot of times. It's not really taking the time to understand it. Most people go to church want the preacher to do something to bless them. Well, best thing he can do for you is open up the scriptures to you and let you see it in the scriptures. I think that's what a preacher is supposed to do, and is point you to Jesus, and no matter where we are. And so uh, we've been looking at Christ in the Old Testament. He said, beginning at Moses and the prophets, Luke twenty four twenty seven, beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded in them all things in the scriptures concerning himself. And that means since there was no New Testament, he had to go back through the Old Testament and preach. So we're doing what Jesus done on the Damasc on the Emmaus Road. Uh, we don't really know what he preached. I'd love to heard that sermon. But uh, let's turn uh, 1 Samuel 17. Now, there's no way I can read all this story. I mean, there's uh, uh, 58 verses total in this, in this story, so we're not going to read all of those. But uh, we're going to read what we can right here. Uh, let's start, uh, let's skip down to verse 45. And then I'm just going to fill you in as we go. Uh, that sounds good right there. Uh, verse 45. Then, David, uh, then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcasses, uh, give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, that... All the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all the assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's. And He will give you into our hands. Now, y'all know the rest of the story. That kind of sets it up. I like the faith of David. He, he, I, I underlined this uh, last night or this morning, one in verse 46. He said, this day will, will the Lord deliver you in it. I mean, there ain't no doubt about him, man. He's got complete confidence. He said, this day will the Lord deliver you. Listen, David has got complete confidence that God's going to win this battle. Because he knows he's not able. 
And he said, you defied the God of Israel. All God, not needs somebody, all God needs is an ambassador, a representative. You've defied God. And he said, I will, and the Lord will deliver you. And he said, I will smite thee, and I will give thy carcasses to the host of the Philistines, uh, to, to the fowls of the air and the wild beast, so that you'll know that there's a God in Israel. And, uh, and so this is one of the most famous stories in the Bible. I mean, listen, outside of probably Noah's Ark, almost everybody knows this story. You can be a heathen with a bone through your nose, a spear in your hand, a loincloth on, and say, oh yeah, that little boy killed that giant. I mean, it, it, that was supposed to have been funny. Y'all y'all, y'all got it or what? what's going on there? Uh, listen, it, it don't matter who you are. Everybody knows this story of David. And listen, if we don't know it, listen, people know it and probably don't even know it come out of the Bible about the giant slaying, uh, being slain by the little shepherd boy. People know it. And, 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 and listen, I, in fact, I almost believe it's a, to a disadvantage to the truths contained within this uh, amazing historical event that we're so familiar with it. Most of us have heard it so much that we're so familiar with it that we probably really don't pay attention to it as we should. You know, we've heard it so much. We know it so well. Oh, yeah, I know David. He went down there and got some stones, put them in a sling, slung rock, and hit the giant in the forehead. We, yeah, we know that. And, and, and to most people, it's just this. This is what we walk away from the story with. We walk away from the story of an underdog who wins, and, and that's uh, uh, by far too often the only thing we get out of the story. We walk away from 1 Samuel 17 thinking, oh yeah, there was an underdog who beat the big guy. A, a, little, a, a little dog beat a big dog. And we're for the underdog. And, and, and everybody loves that scenario. That scene has been played over. Samson and Goliath, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, story has been paid, played over. It's been the plot of so many Hollywood movies, ain't it? I mean, it's over and over. We love the hero. We love the little, the underdog defeating uh, and, and overcoming. And we like that. In fact... Uh, the basic application is pretty much summarized in the movie Facing the Giants. Now, I ain't got nothing against the movie Facing Giants. Matter of fact, I love it. I applaud it. I think the guy, uh, ain't he supposed to be here in town speaking soon? Kendrick uh, at Unity Christian School. Y'all don't know that? Y'all do know that? It's right here on these magazines sitting in the halls where I read it when I was getting a drink of water. <laughs> so evidently, y'all don't read them magazines either, do you? Uh, I just seen his picture on the cover. But anyway, uh, a great movie. I thank God for that. But that's kind of the mindset we all come away from 1 Samuel 17 with is that uh, this is a story about the little overcoming the big. And, and, and we like that. And I believe that one of the most common errors in interpretation that I'm seeing in our day and age is reading ourselves into these stories. Now, I'm going to say something right here, and this, this, I hope this helps you. If, it, it will help you if you'll listen. When we read ourselves into this story, we mess the story up. Amen. Hey, listen, you know, that's what I want to kind of, I guess, get the point across about, is that we are always want to think, well, we're like David. And we got to overcome our giant, just like the movie and just like uh, the chapter here, just like the Hollywood plot, just like all of our scenarios. We're little David and we're facing a giant and we got to overcome the giants in our life. That's the way we read the story. We read the story as to say that, hey, uh, we're, the, we're the David in the story. You see how we do that? Well, what if you're the Goliath in the story? Why don't you make yourself the Goliath in the story? You might get overcome by somebody. We don't want to do that, do we? No, because, but see, you see what I'm saying? We mess the story up when we read ourselves into the story and we're all going to be David. That's kind of like going to a fortune teller. She's going to always make you David. She ain't going to say, hey, 
I, this don't look good. You're going to walk away with your head cut off because you're the Goliath in this story. No, no, that, that don't pay well. And so in order to, uh, to make people feel good about the story, we got to read ourselves into the story. We always want to be the hero in the story. You ever notice that? I mean, listen, that would be awesome if this were the Optimus Club. <laughs> Sorry about that, Terry. I just I, I had to throw that in there. I'm not against the Optimus Club, but it's, sometimes you got to be in the Realist Club too. Amen? It'd be awesome if this was an optimist meeting, but it's not. It's the Bible, and the Bible ain't always optimistic about the situation. I mean, listen, uh, there's only one hero in the Bible. There's only one hero in the Bible, and that hero ain't you, and it sure ain't me. And that's the problem we have sometimes when we read into the Scripture. We read ourselves into it, and there's only one hero in the Scripture, and Jesus is the hero of the Scripture. So when you come to these stories like David and Goliath, don't read yourself into the story like your little David. No, always remember if there's a hero in that story, that hero is always Jesus. He is the one that gets the glory uh, for overcoming, and he's the one who overcomes. And I mean, why don't we read the story and say, oh yeah, I see myself there in that story. Here we are. I'm Eliab, the critical Eliab who don't believe David can do it. Or, or why don't you be the jealous Saul? Why don't you be the jealous Saul? Oh yeah, I'm Saul. I'm going to chunk a spirit David a little later. I'm, I'm going to try to kill him. I'm going to be so jealous of him that he can't, uh, that he can't, uh, uh, I'm going to be so jealous of him that my eyes are going to roll back in my head and that I'm going to uh, uh, try to do everything in my power to stop him. Or, why don't you read yourself in the story and say, you know what I am? I'm one of them cowardly soldiers huddled up in the tent up there with my knees knocking. Why don't we do that? Why don't we always want to be the hero? I mean, listen, when we're going through this Old Testament, you'll find out time and time again, there's a hero in this Old Testament, and that hero is Jesus. And if we, say, and if we fail to see Jesus as the hero, then we fail to see it right. If you don't see Jesus as the hero, you don't see it right. And I hope you see this amazing story in a different light before I get done this morning. I hope you see it different. Because I believe the Bible uh, literally just like it is. I believe this story is 100% accurate. I believe a little shepherd boy went down to a battle with no armor on and a sling in his pocket because he'd been watching the sheep, took five stones up out of a brook, put one of them in there, and give it three turns, one for the God the Father, one for God the Son, and one for God the Holy Ghost, and let her rip, tater chip. And right between the eyes, uh, Goliath took a stone and fell flat on his face. I'd like to preach on how to get ahead, but I ain't going to do that this morning. Uh, I, 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 I want to preach something different. Because I'd have to make all that stuff up and that wouldn't be right. But, but look, uh, it hit him right between the eyes. You know what I'm convinced of? I'm convinced of when David let that rock go. And I got one of those slings. I got one. I got one when I was in Israel. And, uh, and, I, and you try to throw that thing, I'd, I'd kill somebody. Try and throw that thing. But I guess they got good at it. And, I, and they say if you practice with it, you get good at it. And I believe that David slung that rock. And I believe God was standing behind Goliath. And he just popped him in the back of the head so hard that the rock just sunk down into his forehead. And boom. You believe that prayer? I believe every bit of it. Every word of it, just like it is. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't believe John 3.16. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be in a, I believe in an empty tomb. I mean, listen, I believe it all. And, and, and people ask me, and, and ask me this several times, say, Preacher, you believe in giants? Oh, yeah, I believe in giants. You know what I do? Because I believe the Bible. And if you believe the Bible, as far back as Genesis 6, uh, four giants are mentioned. The Bible said there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. And that after that is what we're dealing with in 1 Samuel 17. A giants in the earth in those days and also after that. You say, you believe in giants? Absolutely believe in giants. If you read the Bible and believe the Bible, you'll believe in giants. Uh, by the fact, uh, the giants have always been an issue for Israel. They've been, an issue, they've been an issue for Israel for a long time. 
Now, we've been preaching through this Old Testament, and I ain't going to get you to turn there, but if you go back to Numbers chapter 13 and start about verse 25 and run down through there about verse 32, 33, right in there, you're going to find out that they sent some spies. Moses sent some spies over to check the land out, and when they go to check the land out, they come back and said, uh, oh, we can't take those people. We can't take those people. Why? Those men are of great stature. And matter of fact, by the time you get to the end of that thing, them guys say, hey, them guys are giants over there. And you know what happened that day? Caleb said, we can do it. Joshua was all for doing it. I mean, Joshua and Caleb was like, Lord to God, we'll clean their clock. I mean, God's fighting for us. And I, I mean, listen, all the stuff we've seen. And you know what they said that day? They said, we can't go in there. Them men are too big. And they turned their back on God that day. Tried to stone Moses and Aaron and them. And, and listen, you know what God said? Because of your unbelief. Listen, that's what began that 40-year wandering in the wilderness when they got over there, just like David was, just like the army of Israel is right here in Samuel 17, they are seeing the giants and they're fearful of the giants and they turn from God and say, listen, we can do a lot of things, but we can't do that. We can't beat those men. And you know what God says? God said, because you don't trust me, I'm going to let you walk around for 40 years and then we'll go back and try it one more time after that generation dies off. You know why? Fear filled their hearts, and it caused them a 40-year delay into coming into Canaan. Matter of fact, if you read Joshua chapter 11, verse number 22, you're going to find out that Joshua fought with giants. And after he fought with giants, the Bible says in verse 22 that he left some in uh, Gaza, he left some in Gath, and he left some in Ashdod. Now, that's three places that he left them. And Goliath here is from Gath, which backs up the scriptural evidence left in the Bible. God always gives us plenty of proof, and he left them there. And the only ones that was left there. And you know what Joshua done? Uh, he made a mistake there. Or We ought to preach a lesson right here on finishing the job. Because if we had killed them all, we wouldn't be no uh, little shepherd boy shoot, uh, shooting, throwing rocks at a giant. It, it wouldn't be that situation had he run all of them out of the land. But he didn't run them all out of the land. And so therefore, we run right back into this thing. You see, sometimes we run right back in to a situation if we don't complete the job. And, and there's a whole message in that, and I ain't got time for that. The Bible never calls Goliath a giant. It never calls him a giant. But it says everybody's afraid of him. It says that he's nine foot nine. I mean, a cubit's 18 inches, so to speak. Average, 18 inches. And uh, listen... And a span. I mean, listen, it says that uh, Goliath's a big old dude. He's almost 10 foot tall. There's men. And listen, I, I told Faye this morning, I said, she was asking me something about Goliath this morning. I, Goliath was a little giant at 9'9. Nine, nine. That was a little one. Oh, King Og over there, his bed was 13, point, uh, 13 and a half feet long, man. That's a big dude, 13 and a half feet. I mean, you don't realize how big 13 foot dude is until you realize that that's putting, that's doubling me and adding a foot to it. I mean, you just took me and stood another me on top of my head and added a foot to it. That's a big old dude. And, some, and listen, this is what the commentators say. They say, well, we're not really sure that he was a, a real legitimate giant. We think he was about 6'6". Six, six. Oh, he was really 6'6". Six, six. So all these guys are huddled up for fear because there's a 6'6 six, six dude down there. These dudes are a lot bigger than that in the NBA. I went to the school with dude 6'6". Six, six. I know what a 6'6 six, six dude looks like, and I wasn't scared of none of them. I mean, they might have had three inches on me, but hey, I wasn't worried about that. It didn't bother anybody, but listen, you know what? Uh, the fact is that these people are huddled up for fear. This is a mighty man of war. He's walking around with over 200 pounds of garbage on him. I mean, listen, he's got metal all over. He's got a helmet. He's got a spear in his hand. I mean, listen, they don't know some 6'6 dude walk around with 200 pounds on him and everybody afraid of him. Why, you could outrun the dude. He couldn't fight. You take a 6'6 dude, put 200 pounds on him, and anybody in here can outrun him. I don't care if you're out of shape. You can outrun a 6'6 dude with 200 pounds on him. Why are they afraid of him? He's a big dude. 
He's a scary dude. He's a confident dude. Well, what's the story say about Jesus? Well, to start with, let me just say this. Why did David go to the battle to start with? Let's look at Jesus in this story. Why did David go to the battle to start with? You know why? Verses 17 and 18. I'm just going to tell you these. We ain't going to have time to do a lot of that. Unless y'all want to stay to 1 o'clock. I don't care. If you just let me know. Y'all just wave when you had enough. Hey, listen, verse 17 and 18 tells us that the reason David, I want you to see Jesus and David here, the reason David is in the battle to start with is because his father had sent him. David wouldn't have been at the battle at all, but his father said, I want you to go down to the battle. I want you to go down to the battle. I mean, listen, friend, the only reason Jesus came to earth is because his father sent him. Matthew, listen, you can find it all through the Bible. I looked up a bunch of references to it last night. Matthew 10 and 40, he said, He that receiveth you, receiveth me. And he that receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. And I want to tell you something. Jesus Christ was on a mission. He had come at the Father's will. And I want to tell you something good about that story that I never noticed last night, uh, until last night. He, He didn't just send him, he sent him with bread to carry down. Amen. I mean, listen, he didn't just send him to the battle. He sent him down there with some bread for those. He sent him with provisions for those. He was coming to refresh those. And I thank God today that the the Father sent Jesus into this world. He sent him into the battle and the struggle that we had. Now, I want you to think about this. I never thought about this until last night. Israel had a problem, but no remedy for it. Israel had a problem, but no remedy for it. I mean, here they are. They're in a situation. They're in a conflict. For 40 days, Goliath has been walking down in there in the, in the midst of that valley. So here's the Philistine army. Here's the army of uh, Israel. And in this valley right here, uh, Goliath would walk down morning and evening for 40 days and say, you bunch of scoundrels, send me a man down here to fight me. Hey, your God ain't nothing. Your God ain't, uh, your, if your God's God, send a man down here. We'll find out who's who. And listen, I want to tell you, he kept defying, defying, and Israel sitting back up in there like, man, we're scared of this dude. They had a problem, and they didn't have a solution. They didn't have a remedy. But I want to tell you something. Little did they know that the remedy to the problem that they had was walking amongst them. They just didn't recognize it. I mean, they had an answer to their problem right there amongst them, and they didn't even recognize it. Nobody recognized the one that could solve the problem. You know why? Because it turned out that David was the remedy for the problem, just like Jesus was the remedy of our problem. And nobody recognized him when he came. I mean, he's born in a manger. He was born in a, in a stable. He was. Uh, they had no room for him in the inn. They didn't recognize him, didn't know who he was, didn't understand who he was, didn't know he was the solution to the problem, walking right amongst them. And here comes David into the thing, and they're thinking, who in the world does this guy think he is? He's the remedy for your problem. When he comes into the camp of the soldiers, his own his brother belittles him. Verses 28 and verses 33. Uh, to the point that he's angry at him. He's hostile toward David. What are you doing down here? Who do you think you are? And listen, and he even falsely accuses him and says, I know what you're down here. It's all that pride, that naughtiness of your heart. Like he knows why David's there. David's there because the father sent him there. But he said, hey, you got ulterior motives down here. I I know what you're up to. You're up to something down here. And listen, when you get to reading the story here, just like Jesus, his own brother belittles him. Just like Jesus was when he comes in uh, to, to play in the picture, his own brethren. He come in his own, John 1 11 said, and his own received him by. So Jesus 
Jesus is belittled by his own brethren. By the way, did you know his own brothers, Mary's own children, did not believe in him? I mean, his own family did not believe in him. I mean, Eliab didn't have no confidence in him. And Shammah didn't have no uh, confidence in him. And uh, Abinadab didn't have no confidence in him. And all his other brothers didn't have no confidence in him. Saul ain't got no confidence in him. Saul said, uh, what are you doing down here? You're just a youth. None of them believed in him. And by the way, if you read verse number 42, Goliath had no confidence in him. He had the same reaction that Eliab had and the same reaction Saul had. By the way, you could have put Eliab and Saul and all David's brethren and Goliath all on the same team. None of them believed in in David. They didn't think David was nothing. They didn't think he was going to be anything. You could have put them all on the same. You know what he said? Uh, He said, uh, I mean, listen, you would think they was on the same team. But when Jesus come to the uh, uh, Pharisees, his own brothers, his own of the house of Israel, he comes on his own brothers, and they said, you're, he said, you're of your father the devil. You know why? Because they was all confederated against him. Pharisees and Sadducees, Sadducees couldn't stand him, but they would confederate together, and they would come together in unity to get rid of Jesus. They all hated him, just like they hated Jesus. Then let me say this quickly. Verse number 32, you'll find out that David volunteers to go fight the battle. He volunteers to go fight the battle. And when you, when you read in verse number 32, he says, uh, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. David said, I ain't been down here long, boys, but I've heard enough. I'll go. I'll go and fight. I'll go and fight with this Philistine. Hey, do you realize that in this battle, one man stood in the place. One man stood in the stead of all of them. It was one man fighting for all. And I believe that's where it comes into play that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That was one man that died at Calvary that day and He died in the stead for all. Hey, there was some other people dying there. Hey, there was a thief over here and a thief over there. They were dying for their own right. But that man in the middle, he was innocent. But he was dying in the place of all the others. It was one man who volunteered to go to the battle. One man stood in the place of all of them one who had complete confidence in God and David said I'll go fight the battle I'll do it all alone if need be and one stands for others as Jesus Christ stood in the stead for us all but I want you to think about this verses 8 and 9 of that chapter if David fails if David fails Israel becomes Captive to the Philistines. But should, which I think they're already kind of captive anyway. They ain't doing nothing, are they? Hey, listen. But if David wins, the Philistines become the captive, the slaves of of Israel. A lot on the line here, right? A lot on the line. It's a really important day. It's a really important scenario. Because if David fails, if David fails, then everybody is going to be captive to the Philistines. And my friend, I don't, I don't even want to think where would we be had Jesus Christ failed. What if he had to really give in in that temptation? What if he really turned them stones to bread? What if he really cast himself off that pinnacle? What if he really took those kingdoms that the devil offered him? What if he'd really give in to the temptation? I can't even imagine in my mind. And, and listen, what if he really had not been who he said he was? What if there'd been no Calvary? What if there'd been no empty tomb? would be captive today, would be slaves in bondage to sin, and the Philistines, the flesh, the world, we'd have no hope. You know something that surprised me? With all that on the line, I'm surprised that they let David go. I don't think, I don't think they thought that one through. Of all the people we got down here, of all the men of war we got down here, We're going to send this one guy, and if he don't win, we're all going to become slaves. 
So Goliath uh, is in the valley. He's hollering at them, verses, verses 8 and verses 44. Uh, come to me. Come down to me. Come down. Hey, listen. Do you remember when Jesus was on the cross? Come down from the cross. Come down from the cross. And David's up here and Goliath is down here saying, come down. And Je listen, when Jesus Christ was being crucified, they walked around and said, come down if you say you who you are. He didn't give in. David put the battle into God's hands. Now you read that in verse number 46 that we just read a while ago. And listen, that in essence is not my will, but thy will be done. Uh, in, the, in looking at Jesus, that all the earth may know that there's a God in Israel. I mean, listen, David said this battle is going to take place, and I'm putting this battle in the Lord's hands. Lord, not my will, but thy will be done, Father. I'm putting it in your hands. In verse number 45, David comes in the name of the Lord. He said, you come to me with a spear and a sword, and I come to you in the name of the Lord. Do you remember the triumphal entry when Jesus was coming in and on Palm Sunday and had the palm branches, and they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. I got a few more points. Y'all got to hang with me right here. Now listen, and I'm fixing to get to the main point. Verse 49 and verses 50. I didn't read down that far, but David took his bag here and he takes a stone. He slings it. He smites the Goliath between the eyes. And he kills Goliath, but he ain't done yet. He ain't satisfied just killing him. He's going to cut his head off. Going to cut his head off. Now, I want to tell you something. I believe, I believe 2,000 years ago, the devil was slain, a, a defeated foe. Now, he's doing a lot of damage. There ain't no doubt about that. But listen, in Genesis 3.15, remember when we preached about that all the way back yonder, Genesis 3.15? He said, Thou shalt bruise his heels, talk to the serpent. Thou shalt bruise his heel, but he shall bruise thy head. You're going to bruise his heel was Calvary. He's going to bruise your, your head. Now, I want you to think about something for just a minute. It reminds me of an old illustration. Of, of a missionary who said that a, a big snake had come into their tent one time. And they said that snake come into their tent in, in Africa. I think there's in Africa. The snake come into their tent. And he said that thing come in there and said, man, he reached and grabbed his machete. And he said, whop, off with his head he went. And he said when he did that, he said they run out of that tent. And he said that tent went to shaking and rocking and things got turned over and everything. He said, I know I cut that snake's head off, but he still done a lot of damage in there when I cut his snake. I mean, you know, when you, you know, I, I handle snakes. I hoe handle snakes. And when you hoe handle a snake, well, pop off with the head. Guess what? They'll still wiggle around. They'll still wiggle around. And I think that's the case here. I think that's the case with Satan. I think he's a defeated foe. He may be still wiggling around a little bit, but the day is coming. The day is coming. And I believe that if we read into this, we read it right, we see a prophetical scenario in all this. Prophetical points. Uh, uh, prophetically, this points to a future time. In Revelation chapter 19, in verse number 11, and I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man could, knew, but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon a white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and treadeth the winepress, the fierceness, the wrath of Almighty God. He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun and cried with a loud voice, saying to the fowl of the air, 
Fly in the midst of heaven. Come and gather yourselves together unto the great, uh, unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and them that set upon them the flesh of men, both free and bond, small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet wrought miracles for him, which he, de- uh, with which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. These were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh." Now, boy, when you get to looking at that and comparing it to over here, back over here in 1 Samuel, I'm telling you, you see a beautiful picture of what it's going to be like when Jesus Christ does return. Because when he comes back in Revelation 19, you got the same scenario you got in 1 Samuel 17. What do you got? Well, as as you come to this thing, you see here that Goliath is a picture of the Antichrist. He's a picture. Now, I could tie him in with 666 because he's got six cubits and a span. He's got six pieces of armor and he's six, uh, and his spearhead weighs 600 shekels. That's a stretch, I know, but I can get some 666 out of it. And Antichrist here, Goliath, is defying the God of Israel, and he's got a federated army behind him. But you see what happens here? That, day, that Goliath is down in the valley. He's defying the God of Israel. And when you get to Revelation 19, all the kings of the earth and their armies have federated together to come into the valley to defy the God of heaven and to accuse him and to make war with him and the two armies face off in a valley in 1 Samuel 17 just like in Revelation 19 in the valley of Megiddo two armies are facing off one army is full of pride and defies the God of heaven and the other comes in the name of the Lord following the word of God following Jesus Christ following their David now, if you want to make it significant, in Revelation 19, 21, the Bible said it, in, in 19 and it, several places calls for the fowl of the air to come. Verse 21, the fowls were filled with their flesh. And in verse 46 of this chapter, David said, uh, he said, I'm going to give thy carcasses to the fowls of the air. Man, you can't make no closer application than that. I'm going to give you carcass to the fowls of the air. Now, let me throw this in right quick, right early. We ain't got no church tonight. Y'all, right. y'all ain't got nowhere to go and ain't nobody out. <laughs> Look right here. Just two more points. Two more points. Look at verse number 25. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be the man who killeth him. The king will enrich with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. What was David's reward for killing Goliath? Well, he he got wealthy out of the deal, but he gets a bride out of the deal. Did y'all get that? I don't know if anybody's listening or not, but, but... I bet Reggie's sitting at home right now saying, praise God, preacher, that's good right there. (laughs) Hey, look, you know what he gets out of the deal? He kills Goliath. He conquers Goliath. Jesus conquers Goliath. And David conquers Goliath. And David winds up getting a, a bride out of the deal. And Jesus conquers the devil at Calvary and winds up getting a bride at the deal. The bride of Christ, the church, is the bride of Christ. And so he gets a bride out of the deal. But not only that, hey, it said that his father's house would be free. And you know what that means is? That means they didn't have to pay taxes anymore. Their debts were all cleared. They were, they were free to go. Hey, listen, their debt was paid for good. And when Jesus Christ died at Calvary, 
Calvary and he shed his precious blood. All my debt was free. I was paid for in full. I don't owe anything anymore. It's all on grace now. I didn't go to the battle, but I'm in the Father's house. And because I'm in the Father's house, hey, listen, there's people that never stepped foot on that battlefield, that never put a spear in their hand and a shield in their hand. And guess what? They're free because David set them free. And just like that, Jesus Christ died for us and in his Father's house. Hey, I want to tell you something. His children are free. Our debt's been paid and we owe nothing. Now, I'm fixing to start amen my own preaching if y'all don't wake up. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good point. All right, now two more points right quick. Look, verse two, I lied a while ago. I say one more. Look at verse 52. Look at verse 52. I want to show you this. Now, if y'all don't get this, if y'all don't get all this, that's all right. I've wasted all week long just looking at this stuff. I've never preached on this like this. I don't even know if I've ever preached on David and Goliath that I know of, not that I remember. Do I remember? Do you remember me preaching? I ain't never preached on David and Goliath. It's been preached to death, but I don't know that it's always been preached like that. Verse 52. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley, to the gates of Ekron, and the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way and, and, and whatever that place is, uh, unto Gath and Ekron. Sha'arim. Hey, uh, look, 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 look. I want you to get this. David defeats Goliath, which is a picture of him facing off with the forces of evil, with the devil, whatever you want to call it. It's a picture of Jesus at Calvary. In the battle for the souls of men, whose slave are we going to be? Whose debt do we owe? Who should we be grateful for? Who are we going to praise? Who's our hero when this thing all comes down to the wire? And David defeats Goliath. And David, it gets a bride out of the deal. But I want you to notice what happened to the Israelites after David defeated Goliath. Listen, you know what happened uh, after David defeats Goliath, the, these Israelites? After, after the, the Goliath died, guess what? Those cowards that were huddled up up there, those cowards that were huddled up in that tent uh, and scared to death and wouldn't go down and fight. Once David comes down there and clears a path and blazes a trail and kills the giant, guess what? All of a sudden they get in fighting mode. Now they getting a little bold with it. Now they ready to go down to the battlefield. Hey, they went in the battlefield earlier, but once David broke free and killed the giant, how come the swords? And guess what they're ready to do? They're ready to chase those Philistines. And that's exactly what they do. You know why? Because they got boldness because somebody died to give them boldness. Somebody uh, conquered to give them boldness. They got boldness. They shouted with victory. I mean, they run off that field Hey, hey, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. I mean, they're shouting and enjoying uh, the battle now. They come to town, and when they get back to town, they're singing praises unto David. David has killed, and David has conquered, and David's our hero. Hip, hip, hooray for David, glory to God. And that is exactly what we've done since Jesus Christ has died. We're just singing his praise. We're just shouting his victory. Hey, I'm telling you, the disciples, were huddled up in fear until Jesus died at Calvary. And once Jesus died at Calvary, they got bold and went and preached. And listen, you know what they done? They said, you can kill us if you want to. They were afraid before. But all of a sudden, defeat has turned to victory. And all of a sudden, fear has turned to boldness. You know why? It's a transformation that happens because Jesus Christ is our great conqueror. Now, if y'all don't see that, I probably need to change churches. <laughs> Let me say this and I'll close. Look at verse 55. Verse 55. Notice this last night. And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, 
Whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, king, I cannot tell. And the king said, Inquire thou whose son the stripling is. David's victory got them interested in who his father was. They didn't even know who his father was. They was ignorant to it. Who's his father? Who's this boy? Let's find out who his father is. Because you know what Jesus Christ came to do? To point you to his father. I want my Father to be glorified by all that I do. Jesus Christ points us to the Father. And that is exactly what David had done to those Israelites. Whose boy is this? Who's his father? You see, we can read ourselves into this story. We can talk about conquering giants, but I want to tell you something. The greatest giant was conquered the day Jesus Christ died at Calvary. We ain't got to conquer giants with slings and stones. The battle's over. The victory's won. I know we go through things. We're facing things right now. We're facing things right now. And uh, we, we're going to face things in this life. But the greatest thing that we face is death. We face death. And the only cure, only remedy we have for death is Jesus. He said, I'll give you eternal life. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though we were dead, yet shall he live. He is resurrection and life conquered our greatest foe death by defeating sin our enemy let's stand together I'm, I'm done I don't know if we're gonna how we're gonna close or what we're gonna do I know I know today that we live in a troubled world and what a wonderful time for us to let our light shine Don't be like everybody else. Don't do like everybody else. Let's point to Him. Are we singing something? I'm going to get DJ to sing us a verse. If you need to pray, these altars are open. Would ask you probably not hug up on them. Just come pray by yourself if you need to with your wife, with your husband, with your children, whatever you need to do. Let's sing.